It's really great to be here. Um, I'm gonna, this presentation is going to be generally informal, so feel free to, if you've got questions while we, as we're moving along, um, please feel free to ask the questions. But um, how many people have been to China? Oh, all right. That's good numbers. Um, if those came 20 years ago, or went to China 20 years ago, and then went recently, they realized really significant changes, especially those that actually um, um, grew up or you know, um, lived in China for a long time and then came back. You'll see significant changes. For me, um, I've lived in Beijing for 15 years, all right? And I come back actually to San Diego because I've got a house here, but also because I want, I want fresh air and I want Mexican food. So, <clears throat> but um, the changes are phenomenal. And when I go from Beijing to a smaller city like you know, Wuhan or Nanjing, sometimes I don't even recognize all of the changes. And, and, I, and that could be after six months and I go back and I'm just like, wow, this is you know, the infrastructure, the amount of development is just incredible. Um, that's going on. So um, I think it's a very good thing that all of you, um, as part of your studies, as part of your work, um, continue to learn about China. Why? Because it matters. It not, it not only matters today, but in five years or six years when you're in the workforce, it's really going to make it, it's going to matter. Um, you may never get to China. You may never travel to China for business. Um, but you might. It might be part of the work that you do. Or, or you will be dealing with Chinese companies that are investing in the U.S. or other parts of the world. In my business, we probably do about, I say, when I first started, with, uh, when I first moved to China 15 years ago, 100% of what I did was inbound, meaning U.S. companies moving or, or um, looking for opportunities in China. Um, today, it's about 80%, about 20% of what we do is actually outbound, assisting Chinese companies with their investments all over the world. And we actually finished up a project in um, um, Indonesia for what is called CAF. And CAF stands for the China Asian Fund, which is funded by the um, Chinese Sovereign Fund. And the, um, the government is very much interested in, in, in um, expanding um, throughout Asia, throughout parts of the world. But you know, part of it is the, the soft power, you know, lending money to support industry throughout, throughout Asia, throughout other parts of the world. China is really expanding in Asia, it's expanding in Africa. And so I've actually, with this project we had in Indonesia, um, once we completed the deal, the president of China was there to witness our contract and about, about six other contracts that were being signed. Um, so it was witnessed by Xi Jinping as well as the Indonesian president. And that made the news. And that was kind of a big deal for us because we were part of uh, that outbound trend. Um, I've actually been given the opportunity to make a presentation in December in Mauritius which if you, if you look at the map, it's, a, it's an island that is um, southeast of, of South Africa, or east of South Africa. And Mauritius is a, basically a launching pad for investments into Africa. And so I'm making a presentation on basically how to deal with Chinese companies and how to work with Chinese companies in their, in their um, opportunities in their investments in Africa. Most of the people that will be at this conference will be African companies. And they want to know, you know, how do I deal with the Chinese? How to work with them? You know, what do they like to see in terms of their contracts and so forth? So I've never been to Mauritius. You know, I've been to South Africa. I've been to other parts of Africa. But this is, a, to me, it's an opportunity to really help and support more outbound investments <clears throat> into, into uh, Africa. So. Um, you, those are the trends. That's what's happening. And I do believe that all of you are doing the right thing by um, monitoring and, and, and watching what China's doing. And so that's what I'm going to try and talk about today is the, you know, the trends, what's going on, what's happening in China. Um, 
you know, basically China has been a key por um, location for foreign direct investment. The economic forecast for this year is going to be mid 7% of um, the GDP. Um, it's dropped over the years from as high as about 11%, but 7.5% is still very, very strong in comparison with the rest of the world is 3% or lower. You know, so China is still going very, very strong. Now, the government is keen to keep that level up. You know, they see if it drops too low, then there's a question of stability. There's a question of pressure on, on the political system. Um, and it's so very, very important that the Chinese government maintain that level of growth. And a few things that the government is, that needs to do to maintain that level is one is continue to, invite, to fight inflation. You know, food prices have gone through the ceiling, real estate has gone through the ceiling in terms of pricing, and they know they need to manage that. You know, if, if inflation continues for too long, people um, get upset. You know, they have in China, last year there was over 100,000 mass incidents. That's basically a nice word for, a nice way of saying they've had protest. And that really, really concerns the party. And the party does not want its legitimacy to be challenged. And so they do not like protest. You know, they do not like to be challenged. And so managing inflation is important to maintaining power. Managing the housing bubble is, is, is important, but I can tell you that the cost of, of, of real estate in China is off the charts. And <clears throat> there's talk of what they call the China dream. And the China dream is no different from the American dream. Everybody wants to buy a house. They want a house, two cars in the garage, they want refrigerators, they want stuff, all right? And, um, but it's getting very, very expensive. And they say the China dream is not possible within the fifth ring road. And now if you've been to Beijing, it's, um, everything starts from the Forbidden City, Tiananmen Square. Because that's the old city within, in Beijing. And then you have the second ring road, third ring road. When I moved to China 15 years ago, um, they just finished the third ring road and they were starting on the fourth ring road. Okay, now it's a fourth ring road, fifth ring road, sixth ring road, and they just announced building the seventh ring road. All right, so anything within the fifth ring road is really, really expensive. All right, and most people can't afford it. I think the last time I looked, a one bedroom apartment within, I don't say the fifth ring road, more likely within the fourth ring road is about a half million dollars for a one bedroom apartment. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous, you know, and so it's almost out of reach, you know, for the middle class. Um, that leads to um, the economic divide continues to widen. You know, you've got the haves and you've got the have-nots. And that's another thing that the government needs to do is to manage that and make available opportunities, that China dream for everybody. Um, the, in addition, they need to um, promote more exports. They know they need to continue that, even though they want to be, get away from being an export-driven economy. They still need to drive the exports because that's, that's been driving the growth you know, for the last 15, 20 years. A big thing they need to control is, is corruption. It is really, really a problem. It is such a problem that it's, um, you can open up the, the China Daily every single day, and somebody is either being um, indicted, um, detained, convicted, or executed for corruption. And they do execute people for corruption. And, and it's a real problem. It's not going away. One of the reasons, one of the catalysts for Tiananmen Square in 1989 was corruption. All right, so it hasn't changed. It's still a problem, you know, and it is something that foreign business deals with every single day. All right, we, as a law firm, we probably spend maybe about 15, 20% of our time dealing with corruption investigations. 
All right, um, and so we have investigations in a variety of industries, anywhere from the entertainment sector, um, chemicals, construction equipment, um, electronic components. Anybody that sells to the government has got issues. The, the drug companies are all under investigation. It's not just Chinese, or excuse me, um, U.S. laws, what we call the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, FCPA, but it's also Chinese law. Chinese, the Chinese government never really enforced their own laws for years. But foreign companies are now very concerned because there's less of a, a process if you get stuck in an in a, in investigation. So these are things the government needs to, to do to continue to drive the growth, which um, um, is important. <clears throat> Trade politics is another, is another issue that we, we deal with. Business, you know, um, the American Chamber of Commerce, U.S. companies um, doing business in China are very, very concerned about trade politics. China does not react well whenever there's a, a uh, WTO case or there's a trade dispute. You know, what happens in Washington really matters in Beijing. I mean, I've, I've been in negotiations, for, uh, JV negotiations, and halfway through the negotiations, the Chinese side says, stop. We want to know why your government is treating China so badly with all these cases you file with the WTO. And I'm like, How, why are you bringing this up? You know, because they're really concerned, they're very adamant about finding out why they're being treated badly. And our, my view is, in, is, well, you're part of the, the rule-based system, the World Trade Organization. And if the U.S., the EU, any country has an issue, then you have a right to go to WTO. There's mechanisms. China's beginning to realize that they need to use that, the WTO system more, and they are filing cases, filing cases against the U.S. and so forth. So, it's been a, a, a learning curve, a learning experience for the Chinese now that they are members of WTO. And um, so trade politics is something we watch because it matters for the business on the ground in China. Um, regional and global politics, <clears throat> whenever there's an issue involving the regional politics, we hear about it in business. That's why you be very, very careful about when raising questions about, well, what about Taiwan? What about Tibet? What about Tiananmen? What about Xinjiang, Hong Kong? Well, those political issues um, are there, and they're there all the time. I'm not sure if anybody has been watching CNN, but yesterday in Beijing, there was a jeep filled with people that drove through a barricade. It exploded, five people dead. Now. I immediately called the Beijing office saying, you know, what's going on, you know, and they said, all the news is blocked. But from what they were told is that it was this terrorist act. It is in supposedly involving, and I haven't seen the news lately, so I don't know if it's been clarified, but supposedly um, it's involving Xinjiang, which is a, the, um, the area of northwest China. Um, the people in that region primarily are Uyghurs, which is an Islamic group, more Turkish, ethnically Turkish people, um, part of the Silk Road. Um, they have issues with the Han Chinese leadership. Um, and so, but the point is, is that it's the, all the news has been shut out, been blocked out. And so the Chinese, the Chinese people really don't know you know, what happened? I mean, what they're getting is a lot of rumors based on, um, on Weibo, which is the, like Twitter, and people are talking about what really happened. But uh, another issue is China's lack of transparency in the news. But the point is, is that the politics, the uh, regional politics, internal politics, is something that's always a concern. Um, the good side, though, is China has done a fairly decent job at managing the relationship with North Korea. You don't really hear too much about what they've been able to accomplish, but the, they are, are, are taking steps to kind of control 
North Korea and the North Korean leadership. And this, this photo, this uh, cartoon on the left is one of my favorite, you know, where the Chinese are like, you know, they have to contend with the, with the leadership of North Korea. Um, and that's, that's very much a concern for even the Chinese people. China has done actually a really good job at helping to modernize North Korea. At the border between um, the Jilin province and um, North Korea, there's a tremendous amount of trade going back and forth. In fact, it's the Chinese that are teaching the North Koreans all about Western movies because they're selling DVDs, all these knockoff DVDs that are going to North Korea and so forth. So um, they're doing a fairly good job at managing that relationship because that's something the U.S. is very concerned about because you know, North Korea keeps shooting missiles off towards Japan and South Korea and so forth. So, but that's, that's something that we live with. We hear about in our, our negotiations um, with, for, for companies that are operating in China. There's also maritime disputes. You read about the um, <clears throat> Chinese Coast Guard that are circulating around the, um, the um, Sinkaku Islands and the Daiyu Islands, whoever, whatever perspective you look at. But there, it's a dispute with Japan, and it's not going away. Um, each side is saying, take, making a claim, a maritime claim, to a bunch of rocks and... It's really about resources. It's also about um, you know, a little bit of resentment towards the way things were resolved themselves after World War II. Um, the US, for its uh, part, is um, trying to manage the situation, but they're also creating, um, and US policy now is really to contain China. I mean, they're not coming out and saying that, but it's more of a subtle containment you know, they've got uh, their support for Vietnam, their support for, um, for Burma, Myanmar, the Philippines. I'm not sure if people watched it, but the U.S. opened a, um, an embassy in Myanmar, which is formerly called Burma. And for years and years, the U.S. was um, one of the, um, was trying to challenge the leadership because of the the, the dissent and all the, um, the human rights abuses and so forth. And the U.S. had no interest in normalizing relationships with the Myanmar government until the Myanmar government said, we've got issues with China. And there was uh, disputes involving infrastructure projects financed by the Chinese government. There was claims that the Myanmar government was improperly canceling the projects. The U.S., um, within a year's time, came in, set up an embassy. There were some changes. They released political dissidents and so forth. And all of a sudden, now Burma's a great place for the U.S. The U.S. embassy is growing. They're encouraging business to, to set up in Burma. Um, so things, but the point, the point of that is, is that China was trying to cozy up to the Myanmar leadership. They got really nervous about it. And it kind of backfired on the Chinese. U.S. stepped in and now has a stronger relationship. Same thing with Vietnam. Same thing with the Philippines. Nobody trusts China in, in Southeast Asia, unfortunately. Part of it is being because they're making claims to islands and so forth that are causing a lot of tension. So <clears throat> at the same time, you see more of the soft power, like the, our representation of CAF, where they are funding... The, a project in Indonesia. So the Chinese are, they are using their soft power with their, their projects throughout Southeast Asia. But it's still, the whole area is, is, is a, in a state of basically you know, cautious optimism, but there's still a lot of tension out there. There's a lot of potential flashpoints. Taiwan is less of a flashpoint than it was 10, 12 years ago. And the relationship between Taiwan and China is actually fairly good. Um, but the relationship between um, China, mainland China, and the Philippines, and mainland China, and Vietnam is not great. You know, so anyway, that's something to watch. Business watches what goes on. You don't realize how much of an impact it has until you talk to a Japanese company. Japanese companies are always worried about the political relationship between China and Japan. Toyota sales plunged when there's tension. 
you know, every Japanese company and their staff very much worry about their security. So Japan is getting tired of being treated, you know, actually negatively because of the political relationship. The business has to be, you know, business has to can be concerned about these issues. <clears throat> Internal politics. Um, I have a situation now involving, uh, and this comes up a couple of times a year, where the, we have a, a client, a California-based, very large California-based company, and they have recently hired a Chinese lawyer to, um, to work in-house in their operation in Shanghai. <clears throat> when this woman, she's, she's a lawyer, Chinese lawyer, when she um, took the job, she had to report to the Communist Party structure about her job change. All right, when she went to do that, they told her, her bosses within the party said, you need to set up a cell within the company. All right, foreign companies like, what? I mean, we gotta, why do we need this? So under the party rules, if there are three members of the party working within the company, then they need to set up a cell. Now, this woman was, thought she was doing the company a favor. She came to the company and said, what do you think? I mean, I'm going to set up you know, the party cell, and I'll, I'll, be, I'll be the leader. Well, they said, this is a, a US company that's saying, wait a minute. We don't condone political activities in the workplace. Um, you know, why? I mean, they were very surprised that she was bringing this up. It also creates issues of loyalty, because she's a lawyer representing the company. And what happens usually is, is that the party and the unions are very much party controlled when they would come in and want to set up a union within the work, workplace. That puts her in a conflict because she, she would be leading the drive to have a union in the workplace. So how we resolved it, we basically told her that you make your own decisions. It's no different if you wanted to have a Bible study in the workplace or some club or whatever. But the company is not, in, not under no obligation to, promote or to allow you to set up a party committee within the company. Now, um, larger companies with a lot of manufacturing actually do have party committees and which are tied to the unions. But smaller, more high-tech companies, they really is not something that's traditionally driven or um, within, their, within the environments. But politics matters. Politics in China trumps the law. Politics trumps business sense. And party really matters. Um, it is a, um, it's much different from in the US in China, there is a lot of members. Um, you may, I mean, people within this room that are in school here may have roots within the party, or your parents were members of the party, you know. And so it it happens. It's that's fine, you know. But uh, that's 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 China. That's the tradition. Um, but the party is a few things about the party is it's not it's not a a unified voice. There's a lot of tension within the party. There's factions. There's parties within the party. And, um, and that's something that you need to be aware of, even though you might read about in the press saying the party says this, the party says that. So they oftentimes may speak with one voice, but getting to that one voice is, is very troubling in a very um, untransparent process. So um, um, it's, it is you know, it is something that business has to be aware of um, in everything that they do because the party runs the government and you need to work with the government for government approvals or, or for to expand a plan, to get a permit for um, product and so forth. Um, right now, the, the situation in China is they've got what's coming up called the third plenum which will take place the first week in November. Every no, October or November, they have party has meetings. 
Last year's meeting was the formal selection of the new leadership, Xi Jinping and Li Keqing, who lead the, gov the, 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 um, the country. The, um, what's coming up in three weeks is the, the third plenum, which will focus on developing the next five-year plan, which I'll go th into in a second. China's economy is driven by five-year plans. Right now, we're in the middle of the 12th five-year plan. But coming up in November, they will start to talk about the 13th five-year plan. You know, the blueprint for moving forward with the economy. Interesting thing <clears throat> for lawyers out there, or actually for business people too, the Supreme People's Court yesterday <clears throat> issued a report that called on, uh, called for the independence of the judiciary from the political process. Now, that's a big deal. Now, they did this, they released this report about four weeks before the third plenum begins, when they start talking about the next five years. Now, China's judiciary is not independent. It is subject to influence by the party, by the government. And that's a problem. For business that has disputes before the courts, we constantly have to think about what's the, what's the political impact. We have had cases where we're trying to figure out what is really going on behind the scenes, and we find out that party members are going to the courts telling the judges, this is what you need to do. Now, that's, that's influence, that's corruption. You know, so yesterday the Supreme People's Court released a report that said we need to do two things. The judiciary must become independent, one, and two, the political side of the government must stay away from the courts. That is a big deal. We'll see what happens, you know, with the, the meeting coming up in November. But um, it's something that we'll, you know, if, you know, we'll see how it plays out and whether or not they're going to go forward with that. There has been calls for other, by other, um, you know, um, professors and so forth that have been trying to drive more independence. But this is the fir first time that the court, it would be very similar to U.S. Supreme Court, that says we need to be independent. All right, you know, the U.S. Supreme Court did that with the case of Marbury versus Madison back, what, 250 years ago, whatever, 200 years ago, that was the first case that said we are independent from the political process. So for the Chinese to do the same thing is a big deal. But anyway, politics and um, the internal politics, there's actually eight political parties. People don't know that. They, they all answer to the um, Communist Party. They have a multi-party cooperation uh, arrangement but nobody can challenge the leadership. Um, there is increased um, tools for you know, public appeals and so forth within the party structure as well as outside. Um, there's more uh, pressure on greater accountability. Just read the newspapers, you can see more and more people being, I mean, higher up leadership, including Bo Shalai from Chongqing, and that's prosecuted for corruption. Um, and so the process is, is, uh, is improving, is becoming, and I hate to use this word, more democratic. But that's not my word. That's the word of Hu Jintao. In 2007, during his speech to the party, he used the word democracy uh, over 60 times. Now, what he was really talking about was inter-party democracy, meaning you've got these factions fighting one another. And we need, we need more accountability within the party. All right, if they don't do that, if they don't have inter-party democracy, you're going to have a split. Then you have two parties. All right, so we'll have to see if they're going through this experiment, um, which is something that all of us are watching. Um, now, the leaders. <clears throat> Xi Jinping is the president. And he has, um, has had spent time in the U.S., um, he, um, spent, he actually came to or went to Iowa back in the 80s. Um, he is um, very well, I mean, he's well known within the leadership, and I think um, his, uh, 
His wife is very famous, probably more famous than he is, but his father is one of the top communist leaders um, that actually right now there uh, is, I think it's the 100th anniversary of his birth. Um, and so they're playing up on that. Um, he represents the Shanghai faction. All right. And um, which is interesting because when we I get to Li Keqing, Li Keqing is on the other side, the Tuan Pai, which is the Communist Youth League fa faction. Xi Jinping is perceived by observers as to be someone more, uh, more conservative, who will continue with the party line moving forward, not really interested in too much reform. Li Keqing, on the other hand, is somebody, it's more of a reformist. Um, he was actually trained as a lawyer, and when, um, back in the, um, when he was in law school in the late 70s, early 80s, he translated a, um, the, the um, British book, The Due Process of Law, into Chinese. And so the, the, the legal profession, the lawyers, see him as somebody that is open-minded and someone that will help drive more of the um, um, economic reform, political reform. Um, and so he um, comes from a different faction. Now, people view his position as a premier um, as um, having a lesser voice than the president. Um, the previous leadership, with Hu Jintao as president and Wen Jiabao, as the premier, Wen Jiabao did a fabulous job as getting out in the community and driving um, a lot of some of the reform at the local level. So Li Keqing is in a position to make a lot of good change. And so for observers, they, they look to him as the voice that will try to moderate um, you know, things more. And so we have to see, it's left for observation as to how much he will be able to accomplish. But those are the two principal leaders um, keep in mind that the leadership is appointed by consensus. And that's why you have one from one faction and another from another faction. But it also illustrates that the party is really not one single voice or one single party. They have a lot of, a lot of tension. And so um, I've been asked questions, um, well, do you think China will someday be a true democracy? All right, it's hard to tell, but what I can tell you is there's three levels. At the bottom, they have local elections, and it's open. They have local elections, and the Chinese government is very sensitive about um, any type of manipulation of that process and trying to protect voter rights, trying to protect the candidate rights. So there is democracy at the local level, all right? At the top, you have these struggles between factions, fighting, constantly fighting back and forth, and calls for more democracy within the party. All right? And then in the middle, where everybody's at, is you have a lot of people venting on the internet. And they're out there expressing their opinions and so forth. The leadership has tried to control that and they continue to try to control the thought leaders that might be crossing the line. But it's, China is moving in a, right, in a right direction. As long as there's more accountability, more transparency, um, and there's continued to be um, an improvement of uh, living standards, they're moving in the right direction. Will there be a situation, will there be um, US-styled elections? Who knows? And, but they're in that direction. You know, as the government, as the party gets more comfortable with the processes, then it may, be, it may be easier for them to accept moving in the direction of being more um, open and having um, multi-party systems. They see what happens in Taiwan, and they want to, in fact, if they want the Taiwanese to, um, to unify, they're going to have to do that. The Taiwanese are not interested in joining into a country where you have a single party law. And that's why you have this situation where you've got, um, you know, you've got two, basically two, two Chinas, but really, really one under one party. You know, so, but 
the leadership knows if they really want Taiwan to accept the mainland leadership in full, then they're going to need to make some changes. And that may be the way to kind of drive all that, is the Taiwanese are basically educating the Chinese on the open election process. In fact, <clears throat> a year and a half ago, I'm back up five years ago when there was an election in Taiwan, they, there was very, very few people from the mainland that went to observe the elections in Taiwan. And they, they had academics, you know, professors and some government people from the mainland visited during the election process to observe. A year and a half ago, the elections in Taiwan, um, it was much more open, more people came over. They had election tourists from the mainland that were going over just to observe the election process on um, the internet. I think it was on um, Sina or Sohu. They were having live election news up to date. I mean, Taiwan um, election news being broadcast in the mainland. It's a good sign because I think you find people in the mainland are very, very interested to watch um, and see the experiment the, um, in Taiwan and whether maybe this will work in mainland China. So it's a good thing. And so we just have to watch how that progresses and moves forward. Um, <clears throat> foreign investment and where it's at within the, the five-year plan Right now, the five-year plan, we're right in the middle, um, and the um, foreign investment is something that is encouraged. It's something that um, is, um, has been driving China's growth uh, for the last 20 years. So foreign investment is very much encouraged. However, they're starting to be more selective. Now, what is the five-year plan? Five-year plan is basically a very broad policy statement. Now, when we have clients that come to us and say, can I invest in China? Can I build a plant? Can I introduce my products and services? The first place that they start in their analysis is the five-year plan. Because if they're not, if they're not part of the policy, um, if the government does not want their goods or services, you know, China's not the place to be. Now, the five-year plan is the, at 40,000 feet. The next level is what they call the foreign investment guidelines. Based upon the policy, the foreign investment guidelines provide specificity as to if, it, if, a, um, if the investment's encouraged or it's restricted or it's prohibited. Now, now that foreign investment guideline has been an evolving document the latest version is, came out in 2012, and there's less items that are prohibited. And um, the government has moved those things off and put them in either restricted or in encouraged. There's a lot more things encouraged today than there was 10 years ago. So we always start from five-year plan, foreign investment guidelines, and to find out what the policy is, what the government's thinking is before um, a client or a company will come into China. If you've got um, you know, client, if we've got clients that are manufacturing in the low end, plastics or textiles or um, those aren't favored. Those are, those industries are things that are considered low end. China wants to move up the value chain in terms of technology, <laughs> so the high tech is encouraged. Services are encouraged. Um, consumer goods are encouraged. Retail, all of that is encouraged. And so there's the, um, the within the policy itself, those things are, are, are being encouraged to come into the country. So <clears throat> key goals within the five-year plan is, you know, to encourage domestic consumption, that's retail. Um, industrial upgrading, regional development, meaning more to the, we the western areas and central areas. A focus on energy efficiency and environmental sustainability is really, really important. Um, and so that's something that is within the plan. Now, on the issue of consumption, 10, 15 years ago, there was less opportunity to, for companies, foreign companies to sell their goods. 
today there's mu much more opportunity. Um, case in point would be in the, the fashion yeah, industry. Fashion goods would be, you know, in the very high end markets, very expensive, off the charts. But today there's more opportunities. China now has outlet malls, okay? Where I live, I live um, outside of Beijing in an area what's called Xunyin. It's near the airport. And the housing complex I'm in is, was surrounded by cornfields. You know, so you're out in the country. And um, within a couple of months, they built an outlet mall across the street. All right. I thought, nobody's going to come out here. Who wants to come out to an outlet mall when you're 20 minutes outside the city? It's not going to work. Bad idea. All right. Then the government put a subway line in directly underneath. I mean, so you've got a subway line. Then they have special buses. So it is so crowded in my neighborhood on the weekends. There's millions and millions of people that come to this one outlet mall. And you know what? They don't sell Chinese goods. It's all Calvin Klein's, Nike, you know, um, Reebok, all the stuff that you see at, you know, the, I mean, have you been to Cabazon? Have you been to Cabazon outlet malls? Or, I mean, they're just huge. It's a huge, huge complex. You know, so anyway, there's more opportunity to sell. You know, companies like <clears throat> DKNY, they were happy to sell their jeans, but they didn't want to set up stores. Now they've all got, you know, 200 stores you know, within a couple of years. All right, so there's a lot more opportunities. The government is encouraging consumption. So business opportunities in general, the, again, FDI is, uh, is still going strong in China, is the top destination, and they have been the top destination for foreign direct investment since 2002. New policies, regulations focus on the high-tech services sectors, energy efficient environmental protection projects, and so forth. Um, profitability of foreign companies, companies are profitable, all right? Every year, the American Chamber of Commerce in China surveys its 3,000 members to find out who's making money. And every year for at least seven or eight years now, they have uh, been approximately about 80% of the companies are either profitable or very profitable, all right? People are making money. Now, they also um, qualify that by saying this includes all their members, including those that have been in China for 20 years or those that have been in China for six weeks. And you can imagine some of the new companies, they're not making, and they actually depress the numbers down. So they, the chamber says that if they were to focus on companies that have been in China for more than five years, it would be much higher, almost 90%. People are making money. I mean, so that is one of the reasons why people go through the trouble of, uh, of getting set up in China. So there's, um, companies are profitable. Services industries are also profitable. Law firms, accounting firms, and engineering consultants, management consultants, um, training services, et cetera. Services have, actually, the U.S. has a trade surplus in services with China. Uh, I, haven't, I don't have the, the most recent numbers on that, but I know it was around 15 billion, you know, compared to the trade deficit in goods. Um, so services is very, very, very strong. China needs um, things like, I mean, they're higher us for their projects outside of China. They need the legal, ser legal services for investments internationally. They have accounting firms, legal firms, um, engineering firms in a broad range of um, um, sectors, even from, you know, after, after the um, earthquake in 2008, there was an uptick in the number of seismic engineering firms that were selling their services to, to the Chinese. So the services is very, very much um, you know, booming. Retail, consumer goods is very much, um, you know, have very much increased. Travel, Chinese are traveling everywhere. Um, where they have the three golden weeks, October, holiday, Chinese New Year, and May Day. It's a, a horrible time to travel. I mean, I've, I've actually, we've, I've already booked travel out of China for Chinese New Year, which is in February, because if I, and I booked it in the summer, 
because if I didn't, I'd be, it would be impossible to, to get outside the country. So people are traveling. You know, you see more Chinese tourists coming to the U.S. It's actually more high-end tourists. It's no longer the package deals where they, you never saw them or they were um, always going to the Chinese buffets. You have more Chinese that are very high-end tourists. Um, so tourism is big. Opportunities in the second and third tier cities is big as well. We see more and more companies that are totally, totally bypassing Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou and focusing on investments in the uh, second and third tier cities. Um, again, demand for high and new technology products is still there. Um, increase in the domestic growth and consumption. Consumers are buying all sorts of stuff. Um, travel, as I mentioned, autos. There's more cars than, I mean, if you have, if, you know, if you've traveled to China five years ago and then you go back now, this, right, at this time, you're going to see there's just way too many cars. In Beijing, they're adding 10,000 cars a week. So there's a traffic, air quality, you know, it's not great. But VW's happy. They're selling a ton of cars. And they're all cars that are amazing. I mean, there's Maseratis. I mean, everybody's, I'm, I never saw a Maserati until I, in, they came to China. I've got a neighbor that's got two Rolls Royces, all right? And one is sitting outside all the time, and it's covered with mud. I mean, it's like, wow. You know, what's, I mean, so people are buying this stuff. There's Bentleys. Has anybody heard of the car called a Malbec? It's a, um, I've never seen it before, but there's a, one of my neighbors has a Malbec. It's a Mercedes, but it's custom made. And so every, it's a, the body and the engine's a Mercedes, but everything else is, uh, you pick it. Like you want oak wood and you want velvet or all that stuff. And it's not cheap. It's not cheap. I, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but cars in China sell for three, four times what they would sell here. I was trying to buy, um, what was it called? The Audi Q7. I think you can get it here. I looked up and then you could buy one here for about $35,000. That same car was like $120,000 in China. You know, yes, VW, I said, you know, is there special taxes? No, it's just market demand. We're just selling them. You know, people want to pay, they'll pay, whatever. Um, iPhones, much more than... Um, now, a question, can you, if, if you go to Apple, can you walk out with a 5S here? Okay, China, you can't. You have to reserve it. I went to, um, I was at the Apple store in Hong Kong, tried to buy 5S, all I could do is reserve it. And I said, uh, why? You know, I, I want to buy, I want to walk out, can't do it. You, you got thousands of people in front of you. The, the one in... Actually, you have to reserve the 5S. Oh, you have to, five, you have to do 5S here? Oh. The seller doesn't uh, move them to China. Right? Oh. The seller doesn't move them to Yeah, I mean, you can't, I mean, in China, it's really, really hard. Anyway, point is, is that the consumer demand is incredible. So... If you've got a product, you know, there may be a market for it. So, but anyway, that's, um, that's the business trends here. There's also an increase in the outbound investments of Chinese companies and high wealth individuals. And more and more people that are buying houses, real estate, um, investing in the U.S. We represent a number of Chinese companies that are looking at acquisition targets. And we have one... I don't want to mention names, but they wanted to buy, through a bankruptcy proceeding, the assets for a company that um, makes drone technology. Well, I don't think it's going to happen, quite frankly, because that's pretty, that's control, you know, and there's, but you're seeing more and more Chinese companies looking for deals. Uh, looking to tie up and to acquire um, companies in the U.S. So you're going to see an increase. And someday some of the companies that you're working for might be, have Chinese owners. You know, this, is, this is a good thing. You know, I have people saying, oh, my God, here come the Chinese. Oh, you know, but what about the Japanese in the 70s and 80s, the Taiwanese? And they came over and made investments, and some of them worked, some of them didn't. You know, they got into the system... 
they made the mistakes, they got sued, you know, they improved their corporate governance and so forth. I mean, Sony, Sony is an example. Sony bought Columbia Pictures. It's very successful. You know, so the Chinese will be coming and they will make acquisitions and they will be um, very much welcome, you know, by the, China, by the U.S. government. Uh, the only ones you read about are the ones that are not welcome, but the, you'll see more and more investments coming in all the time. And, and, that, and that is a good thing. You know, it helps drive our economy. Um, it actually educates and the Chinese on how to do business in the United States. And they're going to make their mistakes. They're going to get sued. You know, they may go home and never come back, but there is, it's a learning experience for them, just like it was for the Taiwanese and, and also the, the Japanese. So <clears throat> all the good stuff, but now we've got um, all the negative stuff, all the challenges. It is really, really hard to do business in China. I mean, law firms are successful because they help people get through all that stuff. I mean, it's, um, you know, here's a laundry list. These are like the top, you know, things that U.S. companies have issues with. Inconsistent, selective implementation of the laws and regulations. You might get a, a court ruling in Beijing, but it may be totally different from a ruling on the same law that you get in Shanghai. So even though the government is trying to have a uniform system, it doesn't work. It's still very much inconsistent and selective implementation. Um, there's also lack of or selective transparency in both the licensing process or in the lawmaking. Licensing would be where you apply to get a license, a product license, and you get a letter back that says, can't do it. And you're like, well, what's the reason? We don't have to tell you. you know, so, but there is changes. There's more pressure on the agencies to explain the reasoning. Why? Because they're getting, there is a, 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 an administrative litigation law that says, if the decision is improper, we can sue you. So that's a big change. But it is still, there's a lot of, um, there's a, a lack of transparency. And the law drafting process, China is struggling with the, um, what should be transparent and what, what should not be transparent. I was involved in 2007, <clears throat> the, we found out, I mean, we was the American Chamber of Commerce, we found out that the um, State Council's Legislative Affairs Office, which is, is the agency that drafts the laws, they had, were about to adopt a new labor contract law. And we heard about it from the Chinese chambers. All right, the law had gone through three readings, meaning that it's almost law. And so where the business community, domestic and foreign business community said, maybe you need to talk to the business community. This is a problem. I mean, the law, the way it's, this draft law has a lot of issues in it. And so what the Legislative Affairs Office did was they opened up the process for 30 days. And they said, all right, submit your public comments. In 30 days, at the close of 30 days, they had received over 200,000 pages of comments. The American Chamber submitted 40 pages but 200,000 pages. Guess what? The State Council Legislative Affairs Office was like, this is ridiculous. We don't like transparency. You're making us read 200,000 pages. Our response was, it's a good thing for two reasons. One, you get public buy-in. The public had the opportunity. Secondly, inside those 200,000 pages is something really good, and it's going to help make a better law. Well, they, they took into consideration about a third of the comments and rewrote the law. It was adopted, accepted by everybody. Everybody felt like there was buy-in. That's the most important part of transparency, is the buy-in. People are aware. All right, you know, with the recent shutdown of the U.S. government, the comments coming out of Chinese government officials and saying, your system doesn't work. Oh, you're dysfunctional. Well, I know we're dysfunctional. All right, but let me tell you, it's transparent. We know exactly what was going on 
in the House and the Senate minute by minute by minute by minute. It's all over the news. Even though they shut down the government, we knew what was going on. In China, you have no idea what's going on. You have no idea how they develop budgets. It's not transparent. And so I said, I would rather have dysfunction than I would have a system which is closed and you have no idea what's going on. So transparency is still an issue. It's getting better. They are getting better at it. And so we're moving in that direction. Um, bureaucracy, very, very user unfriendly. Uh, we get calls from clients that call us up and say, set me up a company. I want it up and running tomorrow. Um, wait a minute. You know, you can do that in Delaware. You can do that in Cayman Islands. You can do it in places, uh, California. But let me tell you the process in China. It takes three months at a minimum to set up a company in China. You have to negotiate your business scope and you have to negotiate your registered capital. The business scope is what you want to do. Manufacture, R&D, sales, distribution, all the buzzwords. Or you have to negotiate the buzzwords, which you want in your business scope. You have to negotiate your registered capital. The registered capital is usually, it matters as to what you want to do. If you want to operate a toxic waste dump, well, your registered capital is going to be high. Same if an insurance company or bank, registered capital is high. If you want to set up a simple management company, consulting company, very low. All right, so those two things you have to negotiate. It's not, it's very, very bureaucratic. When we have people that say, I want to set up a company, we send them a checklist, 25-page checklist of documents that are required. Now, one document is with, if you have a company in California and you need your articles of incorporation, okay, we tell, we tell our clients you need to get a certified and verified copy of the Articles of Incorporation. What that means is you have to go to the, the Department of Corporations, they issue it, and then you've got to get it notarized, and you have to go to the Chinese consulate in San Francisco. It's a long process just to get one document. All right, so it is very, very, very bureaucratic, and that, that, that is a, a challenge for foreign companies doing business there. And that's not just with just setting up a company. It's also involving product approvals, involving um, employment relationships and so forth. It's very bureaucratic. Um, as I mentioned before, the lack of judicial independence and hopefully that's something that will change. These, there was a white paper on October 12th when that came out of the state council. Now you have the Supreme People's Court saying as of yesterday, we need to move forward with uh, judicial independence, and that, that's a good thing. Um, lack of independence of Chinese, for Chinese lawyers is an issue. Last year, in March, the Ministry of De Justice um, issued a, um, an order requiring that all Chinese lawyers give a loyalty oath to the party. All right. That um, creates a lot of issues. Most Chinese lawyers, they don't want to do that. But it, there's a conflict. It really becomes a conflict because Chinese lawyers are supposed to be loyal to their clients, not the party. The party has, is in business. They run state-owned enterprises. They run the unions. And so it creates conflict. But anyway, that's, that's a challenge. I know we're running out of time, and I want to move into questions real quick. But um, the... Uh, other issues are recently is with state secrets violations. You got to be very careful. And as I talked to people this morning in the um, at the World Trade Center on due diligence, state secrets is an issue. You can do so much due diligence before you cross the line, and you uh, may cross into um, state secrets related issues. And so you have to be very careful what kinds of questions you ask during due diligence. Um, Intellectual property protection is still a challenge. Um, if you let somebody steal from you, they will. All right, it happens all the time. It's less and less of an issue on trademarks and copyrights because there is processes you go through. But on core non-patented technology, business secrets, if you give it away to the wrong person, it's gone. And that happens in China. It happens in South America. It happens anywhere. 
And, and so we um, spend a lot of our time making sure companies do not give away their core technology. And that's what makes the company who it, it, who it is, and it's the profitability that drives the company, do not give it away in China. Be careful what you give. Be careful what you bring over in a laptop because uh, people can access that. So th those are issues. The other thing is support of domestic champions. That's always a concern. But the government, uh, for its part, is starting to crack down more and more on the, some of the antitrust and cartel-related issues raised by the state-owned enterprises. Corruption, I could go all day on corruption. And just the key issue with that is it happens every day in every relationship. And you've got to have companies must have a compliance program, be vigilant. Um, and take a, a zero, absolutely zero tolerance policy. If you don't, you're not only going to get busted by the U.S. government, but the Chinese government as well. Um, these are a variety of issues that are coming up. Corruption-related investigations, antitrust, product safety, environmental, and so forth. That is, that is, that is what the, the government is looking at in terms of investigations. Labor-related issues are also a big concern now. Um, and that's something that we, we, would, we deal with as a trend. Um, increase in government tax and customs revenue collection efforts is also is a big concern. You have to be aware of that, those things. Yes, I think that we're out of time, but uh, like Mr. Zimmerman said, he'll be here for a few more minutes. So with that, thank you so no, much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.